The Something You Should Know podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and a free 30-day trial to their service just by visiting audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. Both of my guests today have audiobooks available at audible.com, and you can get one of them for free at audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. Today on Something You Should Know, how to find the best seat in the movie theater. I'll tell you exactly where it is in every theater. Plus, would you say you're a powerful person? We'll discuss how to acquire power and how not to lose it due to the power paradox. The power paradox is we get power by being emotionally intelligent and advancing the interests of other people. But once we feel powerful, we lose those very skills and are vulnerable to the abuse of power. Also, you'll discover how to de-stress quickly. You'll need some honey, coffee, the sound of birds, and a hit song from 1972. And some amazing findings on what we really need to do to stay healthy and live a long time. The leading dietary risk factor in the United States isn't too much red meat or lack of whole grains. It's not eating enough fruit. All this today on Something You Should Know. Something you should know. Fascinating intel. The world's top experts and practical advice you can use in your life today. The Something You Should Know podcast with Mike Carruthers. Hi, welcome to the podcast. As I sit here and record this today, it's actually raining outside where I am in Southern California, and uh, depending on where you are, that may not sound like a big deal to you, but it's a big deal here. It doesn't rain very often, which is why we're in the middle of a huge drought, and we're all quite excited about the miserable weather because we don't get it very often, so it is uh, it is kind of exciting. And despite the bad weather, the show must go on, so let's start off the podcast today with, is there really a best seat in a house in a movie theater? And the answer is yes, according to the THX Director of Global Technology. And THX is a company that's involved in the design of movie theaters and making the experience the best it can possibly be. And he says that when a theater is being built, the sound is calibrated by taking microphone measurements. And while the goal is to make the experience the best it can be for every seat in the house... The closer you can get to where they tested and where they put those microphones, the better your seat will be. And the seat where the microphones are placed is typically in the very center, about two-thirds of the way back from the screen. That is essentially the best seat in the house. If that seat's taken, then the advice is to fan out to a center seat. You want to stay close to the center, but start moving forward, not back. Because the closer you are to the screen, the more you increase what's called your horizontal viewing angle. In other words, the closer you get to the screen up to a certain point where it's too close, the closer you get, the more the screen fills up your field of vision. And that is something you should know. When you think about someone who is powerful, what does that mean, power? What is power? Is it money? Is it influence? What? What gives someone power over other people, and how can you increase your personal power? Here to discuss that is Dr. Keltner. He is a professor of psychology at the University of California at Berkeley and author of the book, The Power Paradox. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. It's great to be with you, Mike. I love this conversation about power because so often you hear people say, well, he's such a powerful person, or he has a lot of power, and Usually, I guess that means, or I assume that to mean he's got a lot of money or he's got a great job or he's high up in an organization. But but what does power mean to you? Well, you know, what power means is it's not just money or military might or politics. It's really how you as an individual can influence other people. It's how you alter the states of other people. So give me an example. Well, we know, for example, that you can have an enormous influence on other people with really good ideas, right? Not necessarily money. Uh, and so, you know, if you have an idea like Thomas Clarkson did, where he really was uh, upset about the conditions of slaves riding in slave ships, he wrote a simple essay uh, in the 18th century, and it really led to the undoing of slavery. So one idea can change world politics, and I think we can be thinking about power as just 
influencing the emotions and ideas and conditions of other people's lives. So when people say, well, you know, I have power or you, you have power or this guy's got power, it, it, it basically means they have the ability to influence what happens to other people. Exactly, Mike. You know, very simply, every moment of our lives when we're with our kids, our romantic partners, we go to work, we're, you know, in a community organization, our power is in each moment do you have the capacity to influence that person, change their mind, alter how they feel? Well, but sometimes you don't need to do that or want to do that. Yeah, and, and you know, ironically, and a lot of people have come to a similar conclusion, when, when you want to try to influence them, they're often reactive. So it's really this capacity to influence others that it's the, kind of the deepest form of power. So it, having a great idea is, is great, but not if you don't know how to use it and express it and get other people hooked into it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so the, the, you know, best way to think about this is my power depends on how my ideas and the resources that I share and the practice that I engage in, to what extent does it move through social networks? And if you have great ideas and you're a hermit living in a cave, you have no power, right? So you got to get out and engage with other people and, and, and spread your thoughts and, and notions. So it's really the ability to communicate your ideas, not just having the ideas. Yeah, and you know, and this is where the science is really painting a really clear picture that, you know, when kids at school, people who have joined the military, people at work, if they really engage in others, right, and they, they, and, and they spread those ideas and they ask good questions and they, you know, express gratitude in these ways of, really engaging face-to-face, that's where your power really lies, your capacity to influence. So is there a, a way to do this? Is there a way, if, if you have always felt somewhat powerless, to up your power? Yeah, you know, there are these, these great studies of, of just that, right, where you, you bring people in and you give them a chance to influence, and, and they're just really simple techniques, you know. So one is, um, you know, make sure early in a conversation that you express your point of view, right? And very often we lose power if we don't speak up. Uh, We can gain power by asking great questions and by uh, showing an interest in other people. That earns uh, the respect that they have, and it gives us a platform for power. So really engage with others and uh, make the move. And once you have this power, how do you make sure that that you hold on to it? (laughs) Well, this is when, you know, this is why I called the book The Power Paradox, which is, you know, we gain power, Mike, you know, as we've been talking about, you know, empathizing and listening and respecting people and sharing and collaborating, all good stuff, right? And then all of a sudden when we feel powerful and we feel kind of this almost manic rush of like, wow, I'm on top of the world here, we stop listening and we stop, we start treating people disrespectfully and we kind of get greedy and so I think the key to avoiding that stuff is just to, you know, just to stay focused on other people. Just make it a, a very steady practice of your daily life. What happens when you've got two powerful people trying to kind of outpower each other? <laughs> yeah, and we've all been there, right? Yeah, you know, exactly. The alphas who are trying to dominate things. Well, here, I love this study, and it's just been published, that asks this question, like, you know, what we know you know, Mike, is, you know, power tends to make us a little bit less imaginative or less astute listeners of other people. We generate worse conversations. We're interrupting people, a lot of bad stuff. And so these, these scientists ask the question, what happens if you take a bunch of powerful people and you have them try to solve a problem? Uh, and they actually are less effective in solving problems than the right mixture of people who are less and more powerful. So, Put a lot of people together who have power, and and you're probably going to get less productive work done. (laughs) When I think of somebody powerful or somebody who's not, I I think of introverts and extroverts or shy people and and very not shy, very gregarious people, that those are the powerful people because they have that ability to engage with people better than the quiet introvert who might rather be alone. Yeah, and, you know, it's... 
it's such an interesting question. So in a lot of contexts, you know, kids at school, uh, if you're working in a kind of a dynamic organization at work, it is the extrovert who, and really you have to think about what the core of that is, which is it's somebody who really is just reaching out to other people, engagement, right? That will get you power. But, you know, Mike, I work in, um, you know, I help uh, consult down at Facebook and Google, you know, engineering and statisticians and data people, and they're given these new kind of contexts or, or work settings, there you have a lot of introverts who are doing really well. So it really, it really depends on the context you're in, how you get power. But you, a good bet is to really make sure you're reaching out and, and building strong social ties. Let's talk a little bit, a bit about the nuance of this, just because I can think of yeah. people who ask a lot of questions, who are, you know, always talking, who are, you know, always throwing out ideas, and they're more annoying than powerful. So the, there, <laughs> there's more to it than just trying to, you know, put yourself in the front of the conversation. There's got to be some nuance to it. Yeah, well put, you know, and we've all, you know, the book, Power, The Power Paradox, talks about these old practices that get you power, you know, expressing gratitude, encouraging people, asking good questions, just stuff your grandma might tell you, right? Um, but we've all been around people who, who seem to be kind of faking this stuff, and, and we, it rubs us the wrong way, the person who says thank you in a kind of inauthentic way. And, you know, I think this is where the hard work really begins, and a lot of people who have thought long and hard about great power, great leaders, just great community members, suggest that it really is this deeper kind of ethical commitment to the welfare of others. And that you can't fake, you know. And once you find that, then these other practices of getting power, of asking questions or kind of really empathizing, readily follow. So, But you got to do the hard work to stay committed to others. But if your intent is to engage others and help others and all that, how do you get what you want? Well, you you know, you have to, I mean, one of the striking discoveries in all of this, and, you know, I've just been writing about this, is that um, we actually, you know, when we cooperate with others, we experience activation in our reward circuits in our brain. When we share resources with others, a path to power, reward circuits in the brain are activated. When we express gratitude and show appreciation to other people, the same thing. We get these physiological bursts of pleasure. So very interestingly, uh, neuroscience has discovered that we find rewarding and gratifying and uplifting being good to others. So these paths to power have their own personal delights. Since it is the title of your book, what is the power paradox? Well, the power paradox is this, this puzzle of social living, which is we get power by being emotionally intelligent and advancing the interests of other people, but we, once we feel powerful, we lose those very skills and are vulnerable to the abuse of power. Isn't that amazing? So the, the, <laughs> that you, once you become powerful, you lose the ability to know how to become powerful. I know. And, and, you know, if you look at history, you see this time and time again. And, and what we find is this is just part of our daily lives. I get power by listening carefully. And the minute I feel powerful, I'm not as good at, at knowing what other people think. So I would imagine that being aware of that might help that as a first step, that if you realize that that's likely to happen, you can guard against it or not. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think, you know, I, I mean... Humans are amazing in how powerful just simple awareness is, right? Just being aware of, for example, some warning signs that you might be abusing your power. You know, are you interrupting people? Are you not listening carefully? Are you, you know, studies show that powerful people will literally turn away from somebody who's speaking and look at something else, check their cell phone or whatever. These are warning signs that you are quickly losing your power and problems may arise. Do you lose power as fast as you gain it, or is it, is it uh, uh, roughly the same speed on the way down as it is on the way up? Oh, that's a terrific question. Uh, really neat question, Mike. So I actually think you lose power more precipitously or fast 
than gaining it. I think gaining power in a lot of contexts is tough work, you know, when you think about rising in the ranks at a, in an organization. Uh, but I think, you know, these abuses of power are quickly picked up by the people you're leading and, and are, uh, make for a quick downfall. How much of this is style versus substance? And what I mean by yeah. that is you say that it's important to get your ideas yeah. across and all that. What if your ideas aren't so great, but you're still really passionate about them and you explain them well or then you're, you know, engaging and all that? And you may not have the substance, but you've got the style. Do you need both or does that work? Is that good enough? Well, you know, um, I don't think there's a substitute for substance. And, you know, the best answer to your really important question, Mike, is, is the studies of the legacies of U.S. presidents, right? And, and what they find is, yeah, it's great to have this style of listening and, and really sort of collaboration and great communication, but you also need a bold idea that unites the body politic or the country. And the great presidents, they have this style, they're great storytellers like Lincoln was, um, they're great listeners, but they, they have this substantive idea of, that really transforms the country. And I think when you look at innovation in the workplace, if you look at great science, if you look at great literature, great film, substance is essential. And it's interesting because, you know, some of the abuses of power that we've been talking about actually diminish your ability to be, make great innovations, to produce substantive contributions. What about the other way around? Can you have the substance and not the style? And I'm thinking in terms of like, uh, and I'm a big fan, so I'm not, I'm not uh, saying anything negative about, say, Johnny Carson, but he was not known as a, as a nice guy or a good listener, a guy who would get out there and engage people, but he had so much talent that he had the talent, he didn't need to do the other stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think you can clearly think of you know, geniuses at a trade, right? At, at, you know, the comic interviewer or the scientist or the, the movie maker or the artist who will change the world through their, their genius. Uh, but I think that, that time and time again, we see that it also, if you have this style that really appeals and inspires, um, your, your influence will be even greater. Yeah. Terrific. Well, well, and you know that's true because you know, you know, guys like, say, Jay Leno, who came out after Johnny Carson, was known for being a very nice, friendly, engaging guy, and he did quite well too. So, no, I think there are a lot of surprising examples of how you know niceness and and just a, a sort of a good character is a basis of of power. Terrific. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks, Docker. Yeah, great observations, Mike. Thanks. Dr. Keltner is a professor of psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, and author of the book, The Power Paradox. There's a link to his book on Amazon on the show notes page for this episode of the podcast on our website, which is somethingyoushouldknow.net. And if you're into audiobooks, you can get Docker's book as an audiobook. And if you uh, haven't done so already, you can get it for free If you take advantage of Audible.com's free trial service, here's how it works. You go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K, and you sign up for their free 30-day trial and free audiobook download. And then you can pick any one of their gazillions of books that are available, including The Power Paradox or any other title, and download it and listen to the book on your on your phone, on your MP3 player, your Kindle, what, whatever you like. It's a great way to consume books, especially if you don't have time to sit down and read a book. You can listen to a book in your car, however you like. It's really a great deal. And you can test it out, take it for a test drive for free, get a free audiobook download and a free 30-day trial at audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K, which stands for something you should know. AudibleTrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. Every day you hear health advice based on research, and sometimes the information from that research conflicts with other information from other research, so you never really know what to believe. But there is actually a new massive study that is different than all the others in some pretty significant ways that is worth paying attention to, and I think you'll find quite fascinating. 
Here to discuss it is Jeremy Smith. He is the uh, author of a book called Epic Measures, which discusses all this. And Jeremy, explain what is so interesting about this information and this research and how you got involved and in, in all that. A friend of mine was a mathematician, and I looked him up a few years ago, and I learned that he was now a professor of global health at the University of Washington. And I asked myself, how on earth does a mathematician become a professor of health? I called him, and I found out that he was part of a global scientific team trying to create the equivalent of Google Earth for health. And that's tricky because you need to draw data from all over the world. You need to fill in the gaps in information you don't have. And just as important, you need to correct the errors and inconsistencies in everything that's already out there. For example, when you add up the claims of all the different groups measuring one disease or another, you find out that everyone dies two or three times over. And obviously that's not possible at the same time many people, causes, and countries are never measured at all. So the idea with this study is let's try to measure everything for everyone everywhere in the same way and make sure the numbers add up in a consistent way. In looking at all that, is, is there, though, a, a, a danger that because different parts of the world and, and different cultures and different people are so different from each other that global snapshots don't mean much? Yeah, if you are someone like Bill Gates or the United Nations and you're interested in devoting your fortune or your efforts to global health, then the big picture is really important. But the cool thing about this project that's profiled in Epic Measures is that you can zoom all the way in to your country or your age group. Or in the case of the U.S. where there's more data, sometimes you can look all the way down to a county level and see what's most important for me or my family or how are we doing compared to the people next to us or the people a couple states over. Wow. Well, that's pretty darn cool. So given what we know, when the dust settles and you look at this, what are some of the real takeaways from this that, that you think people would be fascinated with? And then I'll, I'll ask you, well, let me ask you, one of the things in the press material that caught my eye, that fruits are, are healthier than vegetables. I mean, how would we know that? And, and uh, where did that come from? Yeah, I was really surprised to learn that the leading dietary risk factor in the United States isn't too much red meat or lack of whole grains. It's not eating enough fruit. And this is literally just two, three apples a day or the equivalent. The reason not eating enough fruit is so harmful in this country is because fruit wards off two of our leading killers, heart disease and stroke. It's not that fruit is necessarily better for you than vegetables or something else. It's that we are further away from our ideal amount of consumption. In other words, people are actually doing a little bit better at eating their vegetables than they are at eating their fruit. And so the study doesn't just look at what's better for you in a vacuum. It looks at what are the trends where people actually are in their diet, exercise, etc. You know, when I read that, I Googled it. And I couldn't find anybody else saying differentiating between fruits and vegetables. It is, in most cases, one group, and they're not treated separately, and no distinction is made between the two in terms of health benefits anywhere. Well, this is really a one-of-a-kind study in many ways. It's taking everything ever discovered from everywhere else, all the scientific literature, and trying to put it through sort of one consistent analysis. And it's published in peer-reviewed publication in uh, the British Medical Journal, The Lancet, which is sort of the British equivalent of the New England Journal of Medicine. So when, you know, another really sort of surprising fact on a global level is that, you know, I know lots of people interested and involved in the cause of clean water and sanitation, making sure people have clean drinking water. What this study found is that that is an important cause, but five to ten times more important in most countries is the issue of indoor air pollution, people cooking with dirty cook stoves. And it just wasn't on the global health map before. In the same way, fruit hasn't been on the U.S. health map. But the U.S. findings were introduced 
uh, to the public and this sort of interactive tool where you can play with them, this U.S. health map, at a sort of big presentation at the White House with the First Lady. So I don't think it's, you know, too fringe at this point. Wow. So explain that a, a little deeper about the indoor air pollution, because uh, I've certainly heard that that's a problem, but not, not to the extent that you just stated. Well, if you think about it, if you have a dirty cook stove, which is basically someone cooking in an unventilated way with sort of dung or charcoal, what you have is the equivalent of everyone in an entire household smoking 24 hours a day. And so it leads to lung cancer. It leads to heart disease. It leads to stroke. And it leads to disabling conditions like blindness. And it affects people of all ages, uh, whereas, you know, dirty water is important, and it's especially affecting uh, young children who die subsequently of diarrheal diseases. But the number of children dying at early ages has dropped dramatically. And so you want to address issues that affect people at all ages of life and ones that you might not have thought to study before. But, of course, in this country, not a, a lot of us are cooking with dung. So um, No. Well, in but, this country, we've got clean water. We've got, uh, you know, uh, clean cook stoves. So... Here we do want to look at the other kind of causes of death and the sort of risk factors. As I said, uh, low fruit consumption is an easy thing to improve at low cost for almost anyone. But then there's other issues like, um, you know, smoking is still a leading cause of death in this country. If we eliminated, uh, you know, cigarette consumption in this country, according to the study's estimates, 80 percent of lung cancer cases would be eliminated. And, you know, other things that we are well aware of but maybe haven't had hard numbers on before, for example, are if you pursue the ideal diet, uh, heart disease falls by about 90%. Stroke falls about 70%. Increasing physical activity or lowering body weight can cut uh, the toll from diabetes, you know, somewhere between 30 and 75%, depending on which of those two paths you're pursuing. So you can kind of see, where am I? What are my biggest risks? And you can zoom all the way in. You know, I'm a male in the United States between 35 and 40. For my particular group, the greatest dietary risk factor isn't low fruit consumption. It's actually overconsumption of processed sort of lunch deli-style meats. (laughs) So, you know, I, I should maybe pause before I reach for the next hot dog. One of the things that fascinates me about this is that there is certainly the information in your book, but you don't need your even your book to tell the average smoker knows every smoker knows that smoking is bad for you. Everybody that's eating at McDonald's knows that if you eat there seven times a week, that's not good for you. But people don't even with the information in hand aren't motivated often to do anything about it. A big message that I got after following this research is that public health efforts can be just as or more important than individual efforts. Look at New York City. It's gotten a lot of attention and, in some cases, a lot of criticism for pushing a lot of public health efforts like cutting smoking and making cigarettes more expensive to buy, like uh, restrictions on what can be served in food or even the size of sodas. At the same time, if you are born in New York City today, you're likely to live about 10 years longer than you were a generation ago. It is the single greatest life expectancy gain in this country. If everywhere in the U.S. had the same gains as New York City, we would be the longest living country in the world. Instead, we're about 40th. But are you attributing those gains to those policies? I think that it's, you know... uh, That's a great question. Am I attributing those gains to those policies? I think that they've had a big impact. I mean, smoking has plummeted in New York City, and certain elements of physical activity and diet have improved dramatically because of these public health measures. Other countries, like Australia, have modeled their public health efforts after the findings uh, of this study and have seen similar kinds of gains. And Internationally, you see that as well. I mentioned dirty cook stoves. The government of Rwanda, 
a very poor country in Africa, did sort of their equivalent of cash for clunkers. They saw this finding, and they swapped out a million dirty cook stoves for clean cook stoves. And so I think when you look at what is the biggest problem that people I care about face, you can say, okay, what are the sort of solutions that are out there? It may be smoking. It may be diet. It may be something else altogether. You know, I live in a county in Montana that does very well for smoking, does very well for physical activity, does very well for obesity compared to the rest of the country. But according to their data, we've got a pretty big binge drinking problem, and that leads to car crashes, violence, self-harm, a host of other injuries. So I can look at the data and say, okay, this is actually where our biggest problems lie. What are some of, if if you can do it as, as succinctly as the, the fruit thing, just to whet people's appetite, some of the other things that, that aren't so obvious that that are making a difference or clearly can make a difference? Yeah, well, there's a couple other things in diet. For example, uh, the study suggests that second only to fruit in importance is actually eating more nuts and seeds. So that includes, you know, peanut butters are just sort of a handful of nuts. And uh, I think that's about 114 grams weekly, so it's not a huge amount. It's just sort of something to sprinkle into the diet. And, you know, in terms of not just preventing premature death, but sort of helping yourself live a long life to the end, uh, they suggest that the biggest issues people face are low back pain, depression, neck pain, anxiety disorders. And a lot of these actually can be addressed with things like regular stretching breaks or, uh, you know, proven interventions for depression and anxiety, including therapy. So uh, things like a pain in the neck you might just dismiss, are actually pretty important, affecting a lot of people, and can be addressed. And are there things that, that, any misconceptions that you find, that people think one thing is good for you when it's really not so great, or, or vice versa, that they think is bad for you that's really not so great, so bad for you, that, we, that we're da- traveling down the wrong road? Well, <laughs> I'd, I'd hate to lead people uh, too far into sin, uh, whatever that means, but... You know, diet high in red meat uh, doesn't sort of ring very high, for example, in the sort of toll, according to this study. Uh, Diet high in processed meat is much more important. So I guess you could say, hey, it's okay to have the steak, but maybe skip the bologna. (laughs) So uh, another sort of surprise killer to me were the host of injuries. I mean, worldwide, road injuries kill more people than AIDS falls kill more than people than brain cancer. Drowning claims many more people uh, than a lot of causes of death that you might think of much sooner. I read, I read in, the, in the material um, something about um, that when you look at death certificates, this, uh, a huge percentage of them are medically impossible causes of death. Yeah, this is a sort of scary fact. Every year, about 50 million people die. Only a third of them have death certificates. Even in countries like the U.S., where we have death certificates, about a quarter of them are just inaccurate on their face. They have causes of death like senility, hangnail, or something subtle like heart failure. Think about heart failure. Everyone who's dead has had heart failure. Was it caused by drowning? Was it caused by a car crash? Was it caused by a heart attack? You have to know that if you want to help save lives. Just to put it in perspective, I mean, there are studies out every day purporting that, you know, you should do this to live longer and do this to prevent disease. So explain how the study you're talking about is different than, you know, the usual studies that show up in the paper every day. This is a thousand scientists in over a hundred countries spending about a quarter of a billion dollars over a 20-year period to pull this all together. And they're now updating it annually and in some cases even quarterly. And what I love is if you go to healthdata.org, their website, you can play with the visualizations themselves, yourself, and uh, sort of zoom in and look up whatever you're particularly interested in. Wow, fascinating. Well, great. Well, I appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, and uh, I appreciate the show.
That's Jeremy Smith. He is the author of the book Epic Measures, One Doctor, Seven Billion Patients. And there is a link to his book on Amazon on our website. The show notes page for this episode has it. It's at somethingyoushouldknow.net. And finally today, how to de-stress when you're all worked up. Because sometimes you just, you just need to chill. And here are some proven ways that will help you de-stress really, really quickly. First, smell coffee. Our sense of smell is 10,000 times more powerful than any other sense in the body. Sniffing coffee or citrus fruit helps you de-stress by creating balance between your nervous system, brain chemistry, and hormones. Here's another one. Eat honey. Researchers in New Zealand confirmed the long-held belief that among its many healing properties... Honey can reduce anxiety and calm the mind. Have a good laugh or cry. Both stimulate the vagus nerve, which reduces the level of cortisol, which is the stress hormone in your blood, and increases serotonin production in the brain. A good laugh also boosts your energy, and a new study shows that it may improve short-term memory as you get older. Run cold water over your wrists. By dripping cool water on the pressure points on your wrist and splashing it behind your ears, you cool the arteries right under the skin, taking the heat down a notch and calming your whole body. And listen to birds, recorded birds or live birds. The sound of birds in the wild can have a restorative effect. And finally, and there is no scientific evidence that Anybody's ever found to prove this, but people swear that listening to the 1972 song I Can See Clearly Now by Johnny Nash can have instant, instant stress-reducing effects and make you more optimistic. And that's something you should know. The podcast today has been sponsored by Audible.com. For your free audiobook download and free 30-day trial to the Audible service, Just go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K and sign up. That's audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K for your free audiobook download and free 30-day trial. I'm Mike Carruthers. Thanks for listening today to Something You Should Know.